welcome to your at home worship or devotion or time of prayer this week. And this week, our scripture that centers it all is a, a little snapshot in the Joseph story, it, the, the little saga with Potiphar. You may be familiar with it, and I'll just leave it at that. When you get to the scripture, we'll see how familiar it sounds. But one of the things that's happening in that passage, and we'll talk more about it in the sermon, but one of the things that's happening is there's two stories going on. The story that the world is telling about Joseph, and then the story that God is telling. And these two stories, they don't seem to overlap much, if at all. And you know, we know what that's like. This tension, this confusing gap, not only is this at the heart of faith, today it's going to be at the heart of worship. So at this time of um, prayer and reflection and preparation to get us started for worship, I invite you to start considering that. A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 39, verses 1 through 23. Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and with him there, he had no concern for anything but the food that he ate. Now Joseph was a handsome and good-looking man, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, with me here, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent to lie beside her or to be with her. 
One day, however, when he went into the house to do his work, and while no one else was in the house, she caught hold of his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called out to the members of her household and said to them, See, my husband has brought among us a Hebrew to insult us. He came in to me, he came in to me to lie with me and cried out with a loud voice. And when he heard me raise my voice and cry out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Then she kept his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story saying, the Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to insult me. But as soon as I raised my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. When his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him saying, this is the way your servant treated me, he became enraged. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. He remained there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in the prison and whatever was done there. He was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know that passage is a bit long, but it is intriguing, and hopefully you were following along well. One of the most odd things about that passage, though, is that, well, there seems to be two passages taking place in that one passage, doesn't there? On the one hand, there's this tawdry passage that's frankly fit for some of the steamiest moments of daytime television. And then on the other hand, there's this passage that soars with the wondrous workings of God. Now, of course, these two passages are one in the same. I'm going to tell one of them. And as I do chart the rise and fall, and you'll be able to tell which passage I'm telling straight away. Okay. In this telling, Joseph has the hand of God on him. And it begins with Joseph landing a new job. And from the word go, he's got that golden touch. Everything he puts his hand to succeeds. As such, it doesn't take long before his boss notices him and promotes him too. What's more, this attention starts attracting more attention. And eventually, Joseph even gains the eye of his boss's spouse. And she's so taken with Joseph that she puts in a word for him. And this word does the trick. It leads to Joseph gaining a, a new position, being moved. <laughs> and there, in that new position, Joseph's got that golden touch. And it doesn't take long for his new supervisor to notice it either. Once again, Joseph is promoted. All right. That's the second story, the story of the working of God, which our scripture tells about. And in that telling, well, Joseph, he has one trajectory, doesn't he? Up and up. Of course, we know that's not really the way it goes, does it? Uh, we know that, that poor old Joe, he just tumbles really from one setback to another. We know that Joseph got that job with Potiphar, not because he was looking for gainful employment. No, Joseph started working for Potiphar because he had to. Joseph's brothers sold him out, literally. <laughs> literally. Joseph's brothers were jealous of that special attention he always seemed to get. And we know that it didn't take long for that esteem Joseph enjoyed to turn on him once again, too, because we know that catching the eye of his boss's spouse was not a godsend. On the contrary. On the contrary, it brought Joseph unwelcome attention. It was gaining the eye of his boss's spouse that landed Joseph in what I referred to obliquely as a new position, which was really the prison. And then that's where our passage cut off. 
it's really in the middle because that story of Joseph's brothers being jealous of him and, and selling him out. And then it stops. And it's something of a cliffhanger, wouldn't you say? Because a discerning listener will not be able to help but wonder if this favor of the Lord that Joseph has, if it's not just going to invite more trouble for him. Well, as it turns out, it does, sort of. <laughs> because it's while Joseph is in prison that he comes into contact with a couple of the king's men, some folks of standing. And while they're deposed with Joseph, they have a dream. And we'll remember from the first part of the story, that's not in our passage, Joseph, well, he has a way with dreams. And these two folks, they tell Joseph about their dream. And Joseph, with the hand of the Lord on him, why well, he can interpret those dreams, no problem. And lo and behold, everything comes to pass exactly as Joseph said it would. Now, you might think that Joseph, having done a favor for two people on the up and up, would want to return the favor, but that's not what happens. <laughs> they get on with their lives while Joseph languishes in prison. And I suppose it's fair to say that it's at this point that Joseph has really tumbled about as low as you could go. But it's at that point, something happens. <laughs> See, after a couple, a couple more long years, at least for Joseph, what happens is Pharaoh has a dream, <laughs> an upsetting dream, a dream no one can sort out. That reminds one of the, one of the king's men that Joseph met about him. <laughs> Hearing about this dream the Pharaoh had that no one can make heads or tails of, reminds one of them about this prisoner they knew all these years ago, all those years ago, this prisoner who could interpret dreams. And so what one of them does is they tell the Pharaoh about Joseph, not for Joseph's sake, but for their sake, because they want to uh, do a good favor for the Pharaoh. Well, in short order, Joseph is brought before the Pharaoh and told the details of the dream. Without missing a beat, <laughs> without missing a beat, Joseph interprets the dream. And then, for good measure, Joseph suggests some shrewd legislation so that the Pharaoh can take advantage of the dream's meaning. The Pharaoh's pretty impressed with this. And it's not until that point that the favor of the Lord finally seems to be paying off for Joseph. Because it isn't until the Pharaoh, just like Potiphar before him and the chief jailer before him still, it's not until the Pharaoh does like them and promotes Joseph that Joseph becomes untouchable. At last, Joseph is elevated to such a rank that nothing can threaten his standing anymore. And then it's right there, at the peak of his powers, that Joseph crosses paths with his treacherous brothers that he's brought to the beginning of his story. And if this were a revenge movie, this would be the point where Joseph let his brothers have it. But instead of telling his brothers just how far he's come, Joseph is undone by this chance encounter. Now that he's finally holding all the cards, Joseph can't seem to bring himself to play any. In one last unexpected twist, God's favor seems to bring Joseph to his lowest at the exact moment he finally stands to, to enjoy all of his good fortune. Or does it? Or does it? Or does it? Looking as brothers after all those years, seeing all the twists and turns, the highs and the lows and the ins and the outs, Joseph sees something, something he had never seen before. Joseph sees that he can't see a darn thing. <laughs> Gobsmacked, Joseph grabs his brothers and instead of throttling them, he embraces them. He embraces them. And through tears, Joseph chokes out, even though. He says to his brothers, even though you intended it for evil, God used it for good. Looking back over it all, Joseph sees something he could never see in the moment. Joseph sees that what 
looked like highs were really lows, and what looked like lows were really highs. You see, when it comes to faith, it's always a matter of hindsight. God has determined to keep the future oblique, but through the eyes of faith, God has chosen to reveal the past. And what we see when we look at the past is that we couldn't see a thing. Our eyes are terrible for discerning the work of God. Our, our eyes always think we can spot a blessing when we see one. But what the hindsight of faith reveals, though, is that what looked like a blessing was really a blight, and what looked like a tribulation was really a treasure. When it comes to faith, you must take your eyes and put them in your ears. It's only when your eyes are closed and your ears are opened that the two storylines of your faith, of your life, that they meld into one. Only when your eyes are closed to those measurements of life are you open to all the promises of God that can't be measured. And when that happens, the story of your life will soar with the workings of God. The workings of God that works through opposites. In faith, the world's blessings will hold nothing for you anymore. And in faith, the tribulations of life will now burst with all the consolations of Christ. In faith, you can walk from this service into the rest of your life. And you can do so trusting that you will look back on it all. And when you do, you will be like Jacob. You will be dumbfounded, unable to say anything. Nothing except the wonder of the wondrous work of God. The wondrous work of God bringing you low to lift you up. The wondrous work of God taking your valleys and making them into the mountains of faith. The wondrous work of God showing you favor through it all. And it's right at that disorienting revelation that Joseph's saga is finally resolved. And with it, so is all of the book of Genesis. With Joseph's face-shocked words, even though you intended it for evil, God used it for good. With those faith-shocked words, the Pandora's box that was opened at the tree of knowledge of good and evil is finally put into perspective. And what does Joseph see? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing except the bare fact that such matters are best left in God's hands. Freed from that burden of trying to measure good and evil for himself, Joseph can finally commend it all to God's more than capable hands. And with that, all, far, all faults are forgiven and gloating gutted to. The past is resolved and the future is opened up wide. And now perhaps for the first time in all of Joseph's life, he really has it all. He has his family. He has the favor of the Lord. And he has peace with it all too. And so do you. And so do you. Yes, perhaps you can't see it right now. More than likely you can't. But that in no way makes these words any less trustworthy or true. In fact, on that great last day, it will vindicate them. When you look back on it all, you will see this moment and hear these words, these words flooding over the rest of them. On that great last getting up day, you will look back and see these words for all their veracity. And when you see that, you will look back on all of your life with nothing but wonder and love and gratitude. Why, you will even give thanks for those low points, for you will finally see them for what they've been all along, the places your Lord and Savior lifted you closest to Him. And that's not all either. Because when God raises you up by that divine embrace, you, like Joseph, will find yourself clasping arms with everyone who's ever wronged you and everyone you've ever wronged too. But there in the arms of Christ, all wrongs will be forgiven and wrongdoings made right. You will have no more grudges to hold, and you will finally ask for that forgiveness you've longed to beg for too. And when you do, because you will, you will do so with the utmost certainty that mercy is all that awaits you. And that is all you will have to speak to those 
who come to you pleading for forgiveness too. On that great last day, with the trumpet sounding of our Lord's victory, you will behold what today's scripture speaks of but never shows. The Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord is with you. And the Lord is with me. And the Lord is with every last one of us. Yes, for now it's hard to see, but in the end it'll be impossible to miss. And on that day, all we will be able to behold is the wondrous work of God, the work of God turning evil into good. And so with that assurance hanging in the air, may you take that word of faith upon your lips. May you take it upon your eyes and look not into the future, but into the past and see this wondrous working of God and take that word of assurance and may it open for you the future too. Not that you must see what it holds, but that you will know that Christ holds you. Amen. And so now, be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And let us do just that. Let us rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit with our hymn.
and now receive your blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now, call, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so now, before we go, just a few announcements. Fall is underway. We've got Sunday school going on before worship now on Sunday morning. So Sunday morning, church, you can join us. Worship with us is here at uh, Faith Lutheran on Sunnyside at 10 a.m. And beforehand, around uh, 9, 10, I believe, Sunday school gets started. And so does adult Bible study. So um, you get plugged into those things. That'd be great. On Wednesday nights, we have confirmation going now. On Tuesday evening, Stephen Ministry is uh, having the training. These are all great things to get involved in. I'm looking at other things that we have going on. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's more. You can just peruse our website and find out what we're up to that way. And that's a, a good way to find information. At the end of the service, we'll have our website. You can go there, or you can check out our, our, uh, our Facebook. You could send us a message. Uh, via email. You could give us a call. We'd love to be in touch, however works for you. But now, now let us go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.